in the gym all the time, right? But without pain, no one is going to benefit anything. And this is true, of course, through the theme of Holy Week. Without the pain and suffering of Jesus Christ, we would not have benefited salvation. But I want to take a step back and I want to talk about a story really quickly that sometimes we overlook because it only comes in a few verses, and that's the story of Christ walking on the water. This story was in St. Matthew chapter 14, the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 6, and John chapter 6. And I'm going to go through the story very quickly. We don't have to read the whole thing, but I want to emphasize a few key points. So it says that Christ went up to pray by himself on a mountain, and it was evening. Very similar to what we're doing now, praying in the evening. And he's alone on the mountain praying. His disciples down on the sea, they get into a boat and they start rowing for about three or four miles, St. John tells us. So that's obviously a long time. It's not something that happened instantaneously. And St. Mark tells us that they were in pain. It says they were making headway painfully. They were in pain. What did Christ do? He saw them, as St. Mark said, he saw them. And he came to them walking on the water. They were terrified. They think it's a ghost. But he says, I will save you. And he does, act, in fact, save them. And he tells them, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. This story is a snapshot of our salvation. And we'll go through it very quickly, these points. Christ, on a mountain high in heaven, existent before all ages, looks down and sees his creation in the sea, which is the earth, in pain, in suffering. Who caused this pain and suffering? Did Christ cause it? No, we did. When he kicked us out of the garden, he said, through pain, through sweat, you will eat. Through pain and sweat, you will give birth. We caused this pain on ourselves. He saw this pain, as St. Mark says. What did he do? He left the mountain, he left heaven, came down, walked on the earth in the exact precise moment in the fullness of time in order to Save us. Save us from this storm of life that we have. And it says in the gospel that this was in the fourth night, fourth watch, excuse me, of the night. And if you look in, in like military time or even in Jewish time, the fourth watch of the night was about 4 to 6 a.m. In other words, very early in the morning, Christ came and saved them. What does that remind you of? One more time. Thank you, George. Very early Sunday morning, Christ came and saved us. And if you notice here in the story, what did they think? Did they see Christ or they thought they saw what? A ghost. What did the disciples think when they saw Christ in the upper room? A ghost. And the same thing that Christ told them here, walking on the sea, is the same thing he told them in the upper room. It is I, do not be afraid, have peace. So the story really is a snapshot of our salvation, but our salvation is personal. Christ saves me every single day. And I want to take a moment and talk to you about our lives, our day-to-day -day life. And I put our life in boats, if you can see it here. I put our school life in a boat. I put our relationship life in a boat, our physical life, our work life, our family life, and so on, and our service. Each thing, each aspect of our life goes into a boat. And because we live in this world, like we just discussed, we brought pain to ourselves, what happens to our boats? The storms come, and one by one, every aspect of our life starts to crumble. We start to have tribulations, we start to have problems. We go through a tough time, and our boat starts to dwindle. We, have an, we are laid off from work, and our boat life sinks. We have a bad test at school, our school life starts to sink and so on, you, you get the picture. So all we're left with is living in a storm. We're living among the world with the waves crashing against us. But that's not where the story ends. The story ends with Christ's salvation. Now I wanna understand something here. If you're sinking in the waters, if you're sinking, who do you call to save you? A lifeguard. Would you like a lifeguard that has no experience swimming or a lifeguard that has experience swimming? Would you rather a lifeguard that doesn't understand the pain of drowning or someone who says, yeah, this is badri. What would you rather have? Someone who understands the importance of your pain, someone who understands what you're going through, and he comes quickly to save you. 
This is Christ for us. Christ is the ultimate lifeguard. As St. Paul tells us in Galatians, he gave himself up for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age. Notice the word present. Every single day I face this evil age. Every time I walk out of my house, maybe even before I leave my house, I walk into these pains of the world, this present age. But Christ is able to save us. And I love this picture of Christ, the lifeguard. Quite literally, he guards our life and he saves us from drowning in pain and suffering. But the reason I want to talk about this this week is this question that I have on the screen. What pain do you have that Christ did not experience? What problems do you face in your life that Christ himself didn't face? And let's think about this for a little bit. Do you deal with people who are sometimes good and sometimes bad? Are they two-faced sometimes with you? He had the same thing. On Sunday, they say, Hosanna to the highest. On Friday, crucify. Are you betrayed by people who love you? Well, of course, he was too. He was sold as a slave. Do your loved ones leave you when you have a difficult time? Are you alone? Do you look around and say, where are my friends? Where is my family? Why am I alone through this tribulation? Well, guess what? They all scattered from him too. Are you discarded? Are you thrown away when you have hard times? Do people ignore you even though you give them love and affection and care day after day? Well, they did the same thing to him. Do they falsely accuse you even though you're in the right? They did the same thing to him. They called him a blasphemer for no reason. Are you bullied at school? Do they make fun of you for your Christian faith? Well, they did the same thing to him. They mocked him, bowed the knee in front of him, put purple on him, and they bullied him. What problem do you face that he didn't see as well? Do people have undue authority over you? Do they force themselves on you? Well, they did the same thing with him. They gave him up to a Roman. They couldn't even face, them, face him themselves. If we just look to the cross, we'll see in this journey of Holy Week all the pain and suffering that Christ went through. Beaten, mocked, scourged, betrayed, left alone. And this doesn't even begin to mention the cross itself. Just look to the cross. What do you have in your life that's painful that could be more than the cross? What more in your life is difficult that Christ didn't see 10 times more? But yet, during all this pain, he was willing to accept, and the verse tells us, he opened not his... One more time. Good job. He opened not his mouth. He accepted this pain. He accepted the suffering for our sake. Why? So he could be our companion. Going back to the lifeguard metaphor, we now have a companion. We now have a mediator in heaven who feels our pain. So the next time you go to sleep and put your head on the pillow and you're exhausted, not physically, but emotionally, spiritually, and you're just drained, understand that we have someone in heaven who feels us, who understands our pain, who understands our emotions. Nothing is too big for him. Every time you feel that you're down and out, look to the cross. A simple look, nothing more. No matter what they do to you, no matter how you feel, they did worse to him. And yet he was willing to go through it. Why? Because he told us, you're going to have this tribulation, but don't worry, I have overcome the world. Next time you are in pain, look at him and say, you have overcome my pain. The next time you're crying and you're depressed and you're feeling that you're done, just remember that he said the same thing. On the cross, he said, God, why have you forsaken me? He felt that. But he turns around three days later and he says, I have overcome these problems. Death itself, the biggest problem that humanity faces, he says, death, where is your sting? What pain are you going to possibly bring me today? I have overcome even death itself. This is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who tells us that no matter how hard your life is right now, I am with you always. And St. Basil tells us the same idea. He says, be glad and bear with patience everything the world throws at us, secure in the knowledge that it is then that we are the most in the mind of God. When he says we are in the mind of God, this doesn't mean God forgets us. Of course not. 
But he, I'll give an example. It's like Saint Simon who carried the cross with Christ. He was the closest person to Christ physically when carrying the cross. How many crosses do we carry day by day? We should feel comfortable, we should feel confident that our Lord and Savior is carrying our cross two feet away from us, maybe even less, right next to us. So when we're crying and hurtful, remember he's right next to you. And not only is he next to you, he sends us an angel to guard us, our guardian angel. Abba Shnuda, the Archmandrite, in his homily tomorrow, will say every day, consider your guardian angel with you. You have an angel right next to you. If you're in pain or in trouble, call out and ask for help. And remember that our Savior went through the same. Rejoice in your pain, because in that pain you are sharing the passions of Christ. And this is the psalm that we just read a few moments ago. Of course, this is a prophecy on Christ himself, but we can turn this into a personal player. He will deliver me from my mighty enemies and from them that hate me, for they are stronger than I. No matter who exhibits authority over you, no matter how they afflict you, they did ten times worse to him. Yet he came with meekness, with humility. He didn't walk as a king. He walked as a sheep to the slaughter, and he overcame those problems. How much more should we endure? How much more should we follow through the path of the cross in our day-to-day -day life? And by the way, we aren't the first people to exhibit this. If you look through the Old Testament, it's filled with stories of people who are in pain, in suffering, sold as slaves, and God says, I will save them in the perfect time. Noah making the boat, the ark, everyone making fun of him, and then God sends the first raindrop. And then Noah is the one who's saved. Abraham, leave your country. Sacrifice your son, as we will hear in Covenant Thursday. He says, okay. And then God gives him a covenant that his children will be like the sand of the sea. He saves him. Jacob, Joseph, Moses. He tells him, I'm unable to speak during the burning bush. And then later on, after all the, 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 the trials in Egypt, we go to the Red Sea in front of us. Pharaoh behind us, there's no way out. God opens the Red Sea. Joshua, David with Goliath, which we will hear on Bright Saturday. Every single time that people are in suffering, God appears in the perfect moment. Do you not think you are more valuable in God's eyes? You are just as valuable as David, as Moses, as Jacob. Whenever you're suffering, remember that God is compassionate and he's enduring, he endured for us so that we can also endure with him. And he will send the proper salvation, the proper way out at the proper time. So why are we in, why are we in pain? Why are we crying? As the King David says in the psalm, I will lay down and sleep in peace, for you alone make me well. I have no other peace besides the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then St. Peter later on says, Rejoice as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad with his glory is revealed. When was Christ's glory revealed? Of course, through the resurrection and eventually the resurrection of the dead. That is when we'll see our true glory. Your pain today, your suffering today, will be rewarded tenfold, maybe even a hundredfold, when Christ is glorified. When we see Christ in front of everyone and we stand in front of him, all our pain will be worth it. Nothing will matter anymore. The only thing that matters is that we are close to him. Think of St. Mary's pain that we see this week. Think of how much she suffered. It was told of her in the very beginning that a sword will pierce her heart, that she's going to cry. She's going to have pain and suffering every single moment that she sees Christ being beaten, mocked, and eventually crucified. But it says in Revelation that he will wipe away her tears. How wonderful is God that in the middle of his pain, he stops and says, St. Mary, I have a new home for you. He does the same with us. St. Mary is his mother, we are his children. If he cares for his mother, don't you think he will care for his children? Think about the moments where they crucify you, or they make fun of you, or they push you around. Think in that moment, how do you react? Do you react like Christ, caring for people around him? Or do we only focus on me, 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 me? That is not the message of the cross. 
The message of the cross is that even in my darkest moments, I am able to give light to those around me. Even when I am crucified and they put nails through me and they hurt me, I am able to overcome that and eventually rise from my pain and sufferings. And it is that way we are companions with Christ through his suffering. St. Paul gives this a, a beautiful summary in, in Corinthians. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the providence of Asia. So really quickly, he is writing to the people in Corinth and he's explaining to them that when we went to Asia to preach and, and, and serve, we had a lot of troubles. So this is how he describes it. He says, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. That's how much his pain was, up to the sentence of death, which is the harshest sentence you can give somebody. But the story doesn't stop there. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. Again, meaning continuously. So your pain today, your peril today, your sufferings today, you will be delivered continuously. And that's, that's what he says in the next sentence. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And then a few chapters later, he concludes this story, and he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Take a moment when you wake up in the morning or when you go to bed at night and think, what are my tribulations trying to teach me? It says here we are being renewed. Renewed, like so if you imagine you have an old phone, you take it to Apple, they will renew it and resell it. So they, they will polish it, they'll clean it. What are your pains doing to you? Are they polishing you? Are they perfecting you? Think of a piece of metal that goes into the fire so that it comes out and it becomes something beautiful. Is our pain and suffering going to mold us into something beautiful? Or do we take the opportunity to feel sorry for ourselves, blame God and say, God, why are you doing this to me? Take the opportunity day by day to renew yourselves. And this is a perfect opportunity during Holy Week. When you come and see Christ beaten, think, did I do that to myself? When you come and see Christ sold and betrayed, do I do the same thing? Or do I want to be a little bit better? Do I want to change my mind, change my attitude, change my way of life so that I don't fall in the same pain over and over again? St. Paul continues, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Our eternal glory that we will receive if we overcome, as, it, as written in the book of Revelation over and over again, if we overcome, we will receive this eternal glory. When we come to church this week, morning and night, and when on Good Friday, when we're here all day, put a scale in your mind. Put the pains and pleasures and passions of this world on one side, and as St. Paul here, the eternal glory on the other side. The only thing that's going to tip the scale one way or another is your desire. What do you desire more? If you want to continue in your pains and your passions, or do you want to turn your life to this unseen glory that is eternal, as St. Paul says? That is really the question for us during this week. And of course, the answer, hopefully, is that we want this eternal glory. We want this hope in the resurrection. As St. John Chrysostom says, even as the violence of the wind, when it rushes upon strong trees and sways them in all directions, it does not root them up, but renders them still firmer and stronger by these attacks. When you're attacked in your day-to-day -day life, do you lose your roots in Christ? Or do you hold firm in Him? St. John Chrysostom continues, So the soul that is holy and lives in a religious state is not supplanted by trials and tribulations, but stimulated thereby to more patience. And as the Gospel tells us, by your patience possesses your souls. By patience possesses your souls. Take the opportunity to learn from Christ's passions. Through patience, he was able to endure and eventually give us the glory of the resurrection. 
The same is true with us. Now this is all very good, but we need to practically apply it to our life. So I'm going to give you three very quick points that I think are going to help us go away from the life of pain and suffering and towards the life of the resurrection. Balance the scale, make it fall down, and want glory of the resurrection. So this week is a great time, number one, for self-reflection. Take time to this, this week to think whether my pains are caused by my ill-advised actions. And I'll give you an example. Someone who smokes and then they get sick. Are they going to say, God, why did you bring this sickness to me? What's the cause of his sickness or her sickness? The smoking. The same thing is true with us. We fall in problems, we fall in tribulation, and say, God, why did you bring this to me? How could you do this to me? It's not God who brought it to you. Sometimes we do it to ourselves. God allows it, but we do it to ourselves. Think, am I doing these negative things to myself or not? And one way that I like to do this is contemplate on the negative characters this week. We often contemplate on the good people. Contemplate on the, the negative people. Do I nail the Christ to the cross? Am I St. Peter who denies him through my actions? Am I the soldiers who come to arrest him? Am I the left-hand thief who cursed him and ignored him? What am I in my actions? Am I the fig tree that produces absolutely no fruit? Or am I like the foolish widows who did not bring oil in their daily life? Contemplate on the negative, and hopefully we will see where we are short in our spiritual life and where we can improve, so that we can become like the positive attitudes. So for example, am I St. Peter who denies Christ in front of my friends in school or work or whatever? Even if that's true, and this is point number two, turn it around and become the positive St. Peter who repented. Ask God to take away the pain. It's very important to know the source of the struggle, whether it be our mouths, our actions, our eyes, our thoughts, and to turn it around and through repentance into positive attitudes. And I'll give you a very good, good practice that you can do. What brought St. Peter back to Christ? Let's read. It was there. What brought St. Peter back to Christ? He repented. Very good. But right before his repentance, what woke him up? Uh, Jesus looked at him. Very good. And the rooster. Find a rooster in your life. Find somebody that will push you when you start to make mistakes. Find someone that will call you out when you're short on your spiritual life. Ideally, this would be your father of confession. So this is why, we say this to our priest servants all the time, this is why you must go to confession. Abuna is a rooster in your life. This could also be a Sunday school servant. It could definitely be your parents. It absolutely should be your parents. It should be one of us, each other. If I know my brother is struggling, how much more should I go and wake him up and say, hey, Maybe you're struggling because of this, this, and this. Find someone in your life that will give you a nudge to wake up. And follow that person, ideally your father of confession. And then number three, pay it forward to other people. So how beautiful is Christ in the middle of his pain? He doesn't give pain back to other people, but on the contrary, he gives them comfort. So think of the women that were crying on his way to Golgotha. What does he tell them? He tells them what? Stop crying. This is what we should do to other people. Pay it forward. Now, I, I think Abuna might have said this story before, but I'll explain it again. And some lady was driving one time, and the car in front of her, there was a sign that says, please be patient, I'm driving stick shift, or I'm learning to drive stick shift. So the lady behind said, okay, well, it's, this person is still a student, they're still learning, I'll be patient. The lady was driving fine, but because of the sign, the lady in the back was patient. We don't go walking around in our day-to-day -day life with a sign on my shirt that says, I am in pain. Uh, I was diagnosed with cancer. I am mourning the, the, lo the loss of a loved one. Uh, we, don't, we don't have signs on our t-shirts. We don't have signs on our backs that say what we're going through. But each of us, I'm sure if I ask you to raise your hands and say who here does not have problems, no one would raise their hands. Greet one another with a smile. When you see your brother crying, wipe away their tears, as Christ did with the women who are crying. Have patience on people. 
take away their negativity, take away their pain, give them comfort. And I want us to conclude with this verse that we say in Lamentations, which we will, Abuna will say on Friday. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Every morning. I'm 26 years old. 26 times 365 days, it's thousands, thousands of days. Every single day, God gives me, as he says here, new compassions. We should do the same to each other, but more importantly, we should take these compassions of the Lord and take away our suffering, take away our pains, and remember that he's always with us. If you wake up today and you go, I don't know, an hour, two hours without falling into sin, great. Even if you do, remember that he has opened a door for us to repentance through the cross. Through the cross, he wiped away our pains and sufferings, and he gave us the opportunity to enjoy his compassions every single day. May we enjoy this Holy Week and take the blessing of the Holy Week, because through his passions, through his cross and his holy resurrection, he restored us once again to the paradise of joy, and he took away our pain. Glory be to God forever. Amen.